Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit differently. We're actually going to be stepping through an entire Arch Linux install. Now, uh, if you've been with me for the past couple months, you might notice that that is the OS that I use to build my automation server on. Um, I often say that any uh, distribution of Linux will do for an automation server, whether you're using Hass.io or Ubuntu or, or whatever. And even Windows can be a, a good automation server if that's uh, what you're comfortable with. But uh, just to address some of the questions I've had over the past couple months, um, I wanted to walk through an Arch Linux install. It can be pretty cumbersome for the first time installer, but um, the amount you learn during an Arch Linux install about how a system works and the quality of the OS that you get to use after you perform the Arch Linux install, I think is, is well worth any steep learning curve that it might come with. So if this isn't for you, uh, feel free to hop off now. But if you're interested in walking through an Arch Linux install with me, let's go. So the first thing that we need to do, and this is how I start every Arch Linux install, is I navigate to the Arch homepage and I download the latest ISO. Linux.org, and we'll go to download, and we'll just use an HTTP link from my country, which is Canada. We'll try this one, and we will download the latest ISO file. And the reason we're downloading the latest ISO file is Arch Linux is a rolling release distribution, meaning it doesn't have major version numbers. You're not going to see version 1, version 2, version 3 of Arch Linux. Uh, basically, they publish an ISO every single month of the year, and it just basically comes with the same base package as any other ISO before it, but with the most up-to-date packages. So in Arch, um, you'll never really need to worry about doing a full system upgrade. What you're going to be doing instead is just upgrading all the packages that are currently installed in your in your operating system, including the kernel. But uh, we'll step through that in a second. So now that the ISO file is finished downloading, we're going to navigate to uh, the most important part of our Arch Linux install, which is the Arch installation guide. This is. This is what I use every time I go to install Arch Linux. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent resource, and even though you're really comfortable with the install, it's always good to have kind of a guideline uh, to follow when you're installing it. Now, this is a big document. It's a big uh, wiki file. It changes uh, somewhat regularly, and it, at first it can be pretty intimidating to go from a graphical installer on Ubuntu to something like this, where you're following directions and, and trying to identify which drivers you need and which bootloaders to use and all that, but uh, I assure you it's not as bad as it looks. We're gonna we're gonna step through it together, and uh, we'll get it done. So the first thing that we need to do now that we have the ISO is we need to deliver it somehow to the machine where we're gonna be installing Arch. Now, if you're installing Arch on a conventional machine like a bare metal machine, uh, now would be the time to create some bootable media, and uh, you can do that using software like UnetBootin or Rufus or DD, and there actually are some uh, instructions on the uh, Arch installation guide of how you can create a USB flash drive or an optical disk or even network boot it with PXE. So I'm not really going to be using this. If you do need to create a USB flash drive, uh, feel free to pause the video uh, if you're following along and follow this link to create that uh, installation media. And, uh, and then we'll pick up in a second. What I'm going to be doing is I'll be installing Arch onto a virtual machine that I've already prepared. So I'm just going to be uploading the ISO file to the virtual machine hypervisor, and, uh, and then we'll start the install. Okay, so like I said, I've created the virtual machine, and I've uploaded the Arch ISO into the hypervisor. Uh, just before we get started, I just wanted to make a note that I am using a virtual machine that has a UEFI BIOS, which means that it's going to take advantage of UEFI booting. Um, if you're using bare metal or a, a modern hypervisor, you will have, you will most likely have UEFI booting uh, enabled, and that's why uh, I've chosen to do it this way. If you're using older hardware or you've chosen your hypervisor to use uh, master boot record uh, booting, um, the partitioning scheme and the uh, file system scheme might be a little bit different uh, from what I'm about to do here but it's all captured in the Arch installation guide under MBR. Uh, so when it comes to partitioning and, um, and creating file systems, make sure you follow the MBR uh, path if you're using an MBR system. So anyway, the rest of us uh, follow along and we'll do a UEFI install of Arch Linux. Let's get started. 
I'm going to start the virtual machine up and I'm going to check out its screen, its console. And this is going to be exactly the same as you would expect to see um, in any hypervisor or any bare metal machine. This is we're basically just looking at the screen of the, of the virtual machine at this point. So I'm presented with a menu and we're going to go ahead and boot the Arch Linux Arch ISO on UEFI. And what this is going to do is it's actually going to build a virtual uh, live environment uh, for us to do the install from. So it's actually going to load a real Linux kernel. It's going to load a subset of Linux packages and it's going to drop us in an environment. But this isn't an environment that's installed on our computer. This is one that's coming straight off the CD. So we're just kind of temporarily borrowing this environment so that we can install our own onto our hard drive and onto our system. Okay, so like I said, the bootable media has dropped us into a live session. We are now root at Arch ISO. Uh, just again, this is not uh, installed on our system just yet. This is just a live session that comes with a subset of packages. Um, I uh, am going to actually do perform the rest of the install uh, from a terminal on my desktop PC. I'm just, all I've done so far is I've set a root password and enabled SSHD, which are packages that all come on this live CD. Um, this is, these are steps you might want to follow if you are installing this on a headless server, maybe somewhere without a monitor or keyboard. Uh, but for the majority of you that are doing the Arch install on virtual machines, working in this live terminal is going to be just fine. Uh, it's just for the process of making the video, I'm going to use a terminal on my desktop that's a little easier for screen capture. So I'll switch over to that now. Okay, here we are. Uh, the live installation media has dropped us into a live terminal. And uh, we are root at Arch ISO, and we are uh, remotely connected to the, uh, the installation machine via SSH. So now what we're going to do is we're going to perform a couple of standard checks to make sure that uh, the live media has set up the environment the way that we want it to. We're going to check for an internet connection. We're going to check that the, uh, the default key map that it found is correct. And we're going to verify that we are in fact on an EFI system. So to start, we'll do a ping www.google, better if I spelt it right, google.ca. And we can see that yes, we are in fact connected to the internet. And yes, the key map appears to be correct because I was able to type that. And uh, now we are going to just double check that we are in fact on an EFI system. And the way we can do that is by doing an ls against this directory. Sys firmware EFI EFI vars. And seeing how that directory exists, we uh, can confirm that yes, we're on an EFI shell or we're on an EFI system. And uh, we're going to proceed with the installation as an EFI system. Now, now that we have these checks done, we're going to create the partitions that we require. And we're going to do that with a tool called CGDisk. But before we use CGDisk, we have to determine what's the name of the drive or which drive are we going to be partitioning. So we can list all block devices by doing a command called lsblk. Now let's clear this first. lsblk. And we can see we have three drives that are detected. Uh, two of them, the 490, 489 meg loop zero volume and the SR0 602 meg volume are virtual file systems. And these are, are in use right now by the, uh, the installation media. These are the virtual volumes that are we're using at the moment. The only one that we're concerned about is this one called SDA. It's, it's the 100 gig drive that I assigned to the VM. And we're going to use SDA and we're going to carve it up into three partitions that we'll use to install our system. So let's do a, let's, we'll use SDA uh, with CG disk. We'll do a CG disk slash device slash SDA. And it's going to give us a warning saying that it's a non GPT disk. That's expected because this disk has never been partitioned before. So we'll press OK to that. And we can see here that we have 100 gigs of free space. So in this free space, let's carve out a new partition uh, for our EFI, um, our EFI partition, this, the, the partition that the system is going to boot from. So we'll make a new partition. I uh, will use the default first sector by pressing enter. And the size is going to be 600 megs. Enter to that. Uh, the file system type uh, or the partition type we're going to be use is going to be using for this is EF00, which will designate it as an EFI system uh, or an EFI partition rather. Enter to that, and the, we'll call the new partition name boot. This can kind of be whatever you want, but I'm just kind of naming it so that I remember what they are. Okay, so now we have our EFI system and the remaining 99.4 gigs of free space. So let's make another partition. This time I'm going to make a swap partition for uh, 
for for Linux. Seeing how we are only using four gigs of memory on this virtual machine, it might be a good idea to have some swap space in case we have an out of memory uh, issue with the, um, the programs we're gonna be running. So I'll say the first sector default, uh, the size and sectors, we're gonna give it four gigs of swap to match our four gigs of mem memory. Oh, four, oh, four gigs. And the hex code. Uh, and I don't recall the hex code for the swap partition type, so I'm gonna use capital L. Or L, L, swap. Okay, 8200 is the, uh, is what I'm looking for. So you can see here, 8200 Linux swap, press enter to continue, and we'll say 8200. The partition name for this one will be swap. And in our remaining 95 gigabytes, we're going to create a new partition. Default first sector. Uh, we're going to use the very the full remaining space. So I'll just hit enter again, and that'll uh, automatically uh, be the, the the max remaining space. Uh, this time it will be an 8300, which is going to be a Linux file system. Partition name we'll call this system. Okay, so we've created three partitions. We've created an EFI uh, swap partition or sorry, an EFI system partition, and uh, we've created a Linux swap partition, and we've created our system partition, and our system partition is where, we're gonna, where we are going to be installing um, our, our Linux, our Arch Linux install. So if you're happy with this, we can go to the write uh, option, which is down here. We'll write this to the disk. Yes, we are sure we'd like to do that. And there we go, it's done. So now we can quit. And now if we do an LSBLK, we'll be able to see our drive with its new partitions. There we go, there's our SDA drive, and there are the three partitions that we just created for it. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start setting up the system on these partitions. So let's start with the EFI partition. Let's go back to the Arch installation guide, which I have here. And we're going to go down to the heading where it says partition the disks, which we've just done. And now we're going to go to the link here that's on the second bullet point that says EFI system partition. When we click that link, we are going to do a quick search in the page for the heading format. And we're going to click on the heading format the partition. And this is how we're going to need to format this EFI partition for use as, a, as our boot directory. So we're going to format it FAT, FAT32, and feed it its uh, device ID. So let's go check that out. So I will do a make fs.fat f32 slash dev slash, and then it's this SDA1 600 meg partition. Enter, and there we go. It's been, it's been uh, the file system, the pat file system has been applied to that partition. Now we're gonna activate our swap, which we uh, created as our second partition here, SDA2. And let's go to, oh, this is still EFI. We'll go to our swap. So we're going to uh, initialize it with the command make swap slash dev slash ST whatever, and then swap on. So make swap and then swap on. So we'll say make swap slash dev slash SDA2. Okay, and then swap on slash dev sda2. Okay, so it looked that as well. Uh, the final thing we're going to do is we're going to format uh, the ext4 file system onto sda3, which is our main system partition. And in order to do that, we just do a makefs ext4 and then slash dev slash sda3. Okay, and it's going to format this partition. It's a little slower to format this partition because it's uh, it's our biggest one. Okay, now we have all the partitions created and they've all got file systems formatted onto them. The next step is to actually mount the file systems into a place where we can interact with them in our, uh, our live environment. So we'll mount the system partition in slash um, MNT. 
So I'll do mount slash dev slash sda3 slash mnt. Okay, and now let's create the uh, boot directory inside of this uh, mount point. So make directory slash mount slash boot. And now we'll mount our, ES, our uh, EFI partition into slash mount slash boot. Okay, so if we do a DF, we can see that we have our drives, SDA3 mounted at slash mount, and SDA1, which is our, ES, our EFI partition, mounted at slash mount slash boot. Now what we can do is we can actually go ahead and install all the Arch Linux packages. But before we do that, we should make sure that we're using a mirror uh, that's local to us. The way Arch Linux does its package installation is basically the, the live CD that we are booted into only contains the uh, systems necessary and the files necessary to create this live environment. The rest of the OS is downloaded uh, straight from the package repositories um, so that no matter what, uh, even if we're using old media to do the installation, we are getting the newest packages installed with our Arch Linux install. So in order to check out the mirror list, we're gonna go check, we're gonna go to gi slash etsy macman.d mirror list. Okay, and since I'm in Canada, uh, this United States mirror is probably fine, but just for an example, I'll uh, go select a Canadian mirror and put it at the top of the list. So we'll grab this one here. Oops. Copy. Go back to the top. And paste it up there. And the way uh, the, this mirror list works is it uh, goes from top to bottom. It'll start using the first mirror, and if it can't uh, reach it, then it'll go on to the next, and the next, and the next. So basically, any mirror that you have at the top of this uh, list is the repository that Pac-Man is going to use to download and install packages from, including the base package, which is the, the full installation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to actually install the entire Arch Linux system onto our newly partitioned drives, which are mounted, as you know, at slash MNT. And to do that, we'll say packstrap, and we'll give it the directory that we're going to be installing the packages to, which is slash mount, which remember is the root of our new system. And then the packages we're going to install are base and base devel, which basically gives us the base installation and a, a suite of tools to help us compile packages going forward. So this will update the mirror list and begin the installation. It'll take a while, so I'll probably skip quickly to the end. And there we go. The installation is completed and we're ready to actually start setting up our Linux environment. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to generate a file FS tab or a file systems table file. And what this file does is it tells the operating system uh, where the drives are located and how the mount points are arranged. So if we use the command genfstab u, u, and apply that to the uh, mount file system or MNT, where we've mounted all of our drives, you can see that it creates an entry for each uh, file system, each partition, and the file system type on it and uh, where it is mounted to. So we can see SDA3 is mounted at root, we can see our SDA1 is mounted at slash boot, and we can see SDA2 is set up as swap. So we actually want to write this to a file uh, in our new operating system. So we'll redirect that output to slash mnt slash etsy fs tab. etc mnt slash mnt slash etc slash fs tab there we go so we've pushed that file there and now if we have a look inside we can now look at that file that we just created and there it is exactly the same as the output that we saw above uh, now that that's there we can actually Troot into our install, and that means we're going to hop 
into our install locally as a user. Instead of being in this in the uh, in the live environment, we're going to hop into our new environment, and we do that with a command called arch root and then give it the uh, system directory or system mount point mnt. There we go. So now we can see that we are at the root of our new file system. Even though that we popped into it while it was in MNT, we're now actually within our own Linux install and, begin, and can begin working in here just to prepare the environment a little more and get it ready uh, for its first real reboot. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set it, set our local time uh, in our time zone. So we'll do following the Arch user guide now. We've just trued it in slash MNT. And now we're setting our time zone and doing some uh, hardware clock setup and setting up our locales. So the very first command that we're going to issue is going to create a sim link for our time zone and put it in the local time directory. So we'll create a sim link by ln-sf. And the, the file we're sim, sim linking is in usr local time or usr, sorry, Lewis usr share zone info and then region and city. So I'll do America Toronto and that's the closest big city to me. And then I'm going to we're sim linking that to Etsy local time. Create that. And now we're going to set our hardware clock or we're going to set our system to our hardware clock. So that our system time is correct when we do our first boot and then we're going to generate our locales so we do and basically what setting your locale is is uh, telling the operating system how you want uh, text and language to be presented to you so we're going to go to we're going to open up let's see locale.gen we're going to uncomment enus utf8 and then save it and then we're going to run locale gen. So it generates that locale for me. And we're also going to create a file called locale.conf by um, echoing this into it. Pipe that into let's see let's see locale.com. Okay, so that's the locale setup. Let's set up the machine's host name, and we can do that by creating a file called Etsy hostname. And basically on the first line of this file, enter whatever host name you want your machine to be. In this case, I'll just call it test machine. Save and if sorry if you're not following along if you're not a, a Vi user I've I've been using Vi for my text editing that comes by default as part of the Arch installation. Um, if you're not very familiar with it, you might want to look up a quick cheat sheet on how to use Vi, or um, you can probably also use Nano. I think this comes with Nano. Yes, Arch the Arch uh, in Live CD does come with Nano. So um, maybe I'll do the next text editing example with that. Okay, so we've created our hostname file. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is set a password for our root account. So far we've been using this root account that we've true rooted into, uh, but with no password. So to make a password for your root account, type P-A-S-S-W-D. It'll ask you for a new password. There we go, I've got my new password. And I'd like to also create my actual user account for when I uh, log back in. And that'll be, let's do a user add dash g. And this is going to be my default group, which will be users. And then my additional groups, which will be a capital G. And I'll say wheel storage power. 
uh, we'll say dash m to create a um, a home directory for me with the you know in slash home slash brad and the username will be brad now the reason i've added these additional groups wheel storage power is because i'm kind of creating brad as a super user someone with pseudo privileges uh, so the reason that i've given the brad user these additional groups is because basically i've set up brad as a super user uh, when we reboot and get back into our installation i'll be adding um, pseudo privileges uh, for this user i'll be adding pseudo privileges for this user via the wheel group okay the very last step before we can actually reboot into our environment is we have to set up a bootloader and we'll go back to the arch uh, installation guide here and we will click on bootloader the bootloader is going to be what we use to uh, actually get into the operating system especially if we have multiple operating systems on one computer which is sometimes the case with desktops um, a bootloader can help you select between those those os's multi-booting uh, but even if you don't use multiple os's you still need a bootloader to uh, to boot your linux kernel so we're going to use the grub bootloader and we will just go to we can get to that install information by clicking grub and then we'll go to uefi systems installation and so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to install the grub and efi boot manager packages so let's do that using pacman grub and efi boot manager Say yes to that. So if you haven't already noticed, Pacman is the package manager of choice on Arch Linux. And when you're using it, you just do a pacman s uh, and then the package name to get to download that package. Once we have those, we are going to run the following command. Grub dash install target x86 64 EFI dash dash EFI directory uh, we're going to set the EFI directory to what we named it, which is slash boot. And the bootloader ID is going to be grub. So we'll run that. There we go. And now we just need to generate a grub configuration file. So what I was saying earlier, if you have multiple operating systems on your, on your computer and you want grub to detect those, you first need to install something called OS, Pro, OS Prober. And basically this tool gives Grub the ability to see other OSs like Windows or other Linux installs on their machine. In my case, I don't need it. I'm just using a virtual machine that has, you know, only one, uh, only one uh, operating system on it. But it's, uh, it's something that you might use in your use case. Uh, the last step is to create the Grub config, uh, which if we had multiple OSs would take make use of OS Prober. But in my case, it's just going to look at my one install so we can see that it found the Linux image that we're going to be using and it's going to put it into a file uh, that grub will use to boot that image okay so that grub make config uh, was successful and we're actually ready to reboot our system now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back up the console here so that when I issue the reboot command we can actually see the machine reboot Important to exit the troot first and then reboot. So we can see the machine is restarting. And there's our grub bootloader where we have our first choice is Arch Linux. We'll click yes to that. And it looks like we are in. Okay, so now we're fully booted into our Arch Linux instance. Uh, we're no longer under the support of the Arch ISO. This is our 100% our new install. I'm gonna go ahead and log in. Oh, log in. And I'm gonna run through a couple quick steps the, um, just to get us up and going uh, in our new install. First, I'm gonna check for an internet connection. 
And as you can see here, ENS18 does not have any uh, IP associated with it. So it's, it has no network connection, no internet connection. And the reason for that is because we haven't enabled DHCP uh, for that adapter. So it can't pull an IP address from our router. So I'll quickly, oh, what's this? Enable DHCP CD at ENS18. And that'll make sure that DHCP starts at boot. And we'll just issue the start directive to start it now. So we don't need a reboot. So it's going to go ahead and pull an IP address from DHCP and it's done. So now if we do IP, you can see that we have an IP address, we have an internet connection, everything is all well and good. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install uh, an SSH server, SSHD, so that we can remotely administrate it because for most of you these are going to be servers that are either on virtual machines or maybe a headless server in a closet where it's just not convenient to go and plug a monitor, mouse, and keyboard. You want to be able to administrate these remotely. So I'm going to pacman open SSH and we'll install it. Yes. Now that SSHD is installed and enabled, we're going to grant some pseudo privileges to the user that we created earlier so that we can log into the machine as that user. As a general rule, you never want to log in uh, remotely directly as root. It's, it's usually not a good idea, but uh, we'll create a privilege user or we'll, we'll grant that user privileges uh, that we can use to log in. And that was the Brad user. So we'll use vi sudo and we'll go down to the section right here. We're gonna say the wheel group can do all commands with no password, which is still pretty insecure, but slightly better than root. So I'll bring up my, I'll bring up my terminal again and do a remote. Actually, we got a, sorry, before we, uh, before we do that, since we've added the config file, we need to restart the SSHD uh, process. SSHD, and we'll also enable SSHD so it starts next boot. Okay, so now we'll bring up a terminal and we'll attempt to log into that machine as Brad. Oh, that's root. Oh, I know what we forgot to do. We forgot to give Brad a password. Let's quickly go do that. There, now Brad has a password and we can attempt to log in as Brad. There we go. We have logged in as, as Brad at test machine. And we can see all of our files and folders and begin using the machine as normal. And that pretty much concludes uh, the Arch Linux installation. Um, from here, you would just install the packages you need to, uh, to run whatever type of server you want uh, to run or whatever system you want to run. And, uh, and yeah, uh, take full advantage of the Arch Wiki and the Arch User Repository. There's some great resources uh, on there for learning how to use your system. And uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for coming out uh, and uh, I'll see you later.